Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I think uh, we can start. Um, so my name is Anvesha. Uh, today's session is on uh, empowering uh, extension workers. Um, this session will be about how uh, Digital Green is using AI-enabled tools to uh, improve the cost effectiveness of public extension systems. Um, and uh, Digital Green has been working with um, so within the agricultural ecosystem particularly. And so today's speaker is Vineet Singh, who is the CTO at Digital Green. And we also have Samrudhi Mukul with us, who will be moderating today's session. Um, I am not sure if Vineet is on the call yet. We might have to wait. Oh, hi, Vineet. Uh, Vineet, if you could... Uh, hi, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so uh, today's session will work. Um, so Vineet will first uh, present on uh, what the work that Distribution is doing and how they've been using AI and their use cases. Between somebody and Vineet, and then and ask that or if you want to join us on. Zoom, they can just unmute themselves. Um, so you can share your questions in chat, and then uh, that's true. Uh, uh, sorry, Amisha, your voice is breaking. Is it an issue on my side, or? Uh, it's breaking. Uh, no, it's yeah, possible it's my internet. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes. Can you hear me now? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so I was just saying that uh, you can go ahead. A uh, brief introduction of the session is that we'll be talking about digital green and how the you know, AI to uh, work with uh, public extension systems and improve the cost effectiveness. Um, the focus will uh, the focus of session will be on the agriculture ecosystem and um so today's speaker is Vineet Shruti and the format for the session is Vineet will uh, do a short presentation a talk and then Samruti and Vineet will uh, talk a bit about uh, you know the various challenges and uh, risk mitigation strategies and then the audience can um, ask the questions either via chat or by unmuting themselves on Zoom. Um, so that's uh, about the session. Uh, this uh, session is about is uh, part of the AI risk mitigation project that we're doing um, at Anthill Inside, uh, which uh, involves a bunch of sessions of with people across the industry, um, specifically in the agri tech, fintech, um, health, and education domains. Um, so this is an ongoing project where we're talking to people who are using AI and the various strategies that they've implemented um, to mitigate various risks and challenges, either technical or social. Um, so that's a bit about the project itself. Uh, we need over to you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, my internet connection could be a bit choppy at times, so please feel free if uh, I'm not audible or anything of that sort. Uh, so yeah, I'll just uh, straight away dive into the presentation itself. Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh so hi everyone. I'm uh Vineet. Uh I'm I'm working in the capacity of CTO at Digital Green. Uh happy to be here and uh covering about what, what we are we have been doing. So just uh yeah, so this is uh, the official presentation of Vistar, which is virtually integrated system to access agricultural resources, which is one of the DPI uh, digital public infrastructure that we have uh, we are creating with Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Government of India, uh, and essentially, uh, just to give a How digital green started uh, was the CEO of digital, green. and uh, primarily the question that he was tackling was uh, how can digital technologies be used 
to uh, help small scale farmers in india and and other places uh it started right here in bangalore uh <laughs> and essentially uh, one of the things all of you know as he was conducting all these experiments uh, he found out that uh, you know the agriculture transformation is uh, is basically dependent on the extension uh, it has played a a vital important role in uh, in the green revolution as well that's the way government can or the programs can be uh, you know they, they can reach to the farmer uh, telling about new seed varieties new practices and so on and so forth and this extension work uh, which involves a, quite a bit of a uh, number of people on ground who speak to the farmers uh, and convey or, or give this uh, information about uh, everything related to farming uh, had uh, had a you know he basically flipped the model so instead of being a very top down approach where a certain program or certain thing is being prescriptive uh, he found out that a lot of farmers uh, who adopt these services uh, these practices and different kind of things they they tweak it on ground and they make certain changes uh, and he would go with videos uh, basically a camera and shoot video of a successful farmer uh, the way they have adopted a particular practice or a particular uh, you know uh, uh, basically record it and show it to the you know you go with those extension workers and ask these extension workers to show it to a group of farmers in 30 40 farmers in you know adjoining villages and places and through this what uh, we were able to do was the cost of adoption which was around 35 dollars uh, at that point of time through our intervention uh, it came down to uh, you know 3.5 uh, dollars uh, per farmer adoption with increase in yield better farming techniques increase in the uh, income as well and there have been different studies conducted by uh, uh, JPAL and other who have validated as an independent RCT uh, on this. So far, we have created more than 7,000 plus videos. reached more than uh, taking this particular approach one of the things that happened in word was uh, or, or something around 2019 was how can we, uh, we we saw that in the 10 years of our existence when we started the farmers are increasingly you know the mobile penetration has increased the farmers are uh, are accessing the YouTube videos themselves so uh, how we further enhance the extension uh, uh, you know the uh, the work that we are doing and uh, and one of the things that we started working on was working with a different kind of uh, chatbots uh, which are very nascent uh, five years back uh, they were they were more mechanical in nature and uh, essentially uh, a kind of a shift came in 2022 December after uh, chat GPT and the spur in the AI domain. Uh, in last one year, we have basically been able to, uh, uh, we started doing pilot uh, and, and upgrading our chat bot experience where the same content, which was in video format, uh, you know, the training that we used to do with the extension workers, uh, all that PDS and all those documents can be ingested on one side. Uh, and then all these questions could be asked on the go on a on a chatbot, uh, like this particular example, where the person is asking this question uh, in local language on their own convenience. Uh, they can ask in voice note because the messenger gives that kind of a functionality and they can get the relevant answer 
plus also the videos. Uh, more, it can be contextualized by sharing the location. Uh, as agriculture is very, very contextual, location specific, uh, it is crop specific, it is weather specific, and everything depends on the on, on the particular, uh, you know, agri uh, climatic zone. So this messenger and, and what it enabled was a very intuitive interface for the extension workers to be able to uh, ingest or uh, access the information that is available uh, on the go uh, in their own language on their own at their own convenience so far uh, we have been uh, able to work in india itself and in, uh, we have launched the bot in five six states it has <laughs> grown in six states uh, and essentially the idea uh, we, we we have partnered with uh, uh, you know ondc vashini and the idea is to create an open network uh, where there are content suppliers, uh, they're content consumers, and then there are open tech building blocks so that people can create, uh, you know, people can exchange or the content can be given and people can create their own bots on the go, or they can have those pipelines through which the content that is uh, available on network can be ingested. Uh, our hope and our goal is to further lower down the cost of adoption from three point five dollars, what we achieved, you know, fifteen years back, to point three five uh, per farmer, and reach more extension agents, uh, and and hence more farmers. Uh, we have launched it in India. We have reached five thousand extension workers, uh, which would close to you know would have touched five hundred thousand farmers. Uh, there are more than twenty commodities that are present. Uh, there content uh, package of practices and so on. Uh, in Kenya, a similar number is there and we have around 150,000 conversations on our bot combined in India and Kenya. Uh, this has happened in last six, seven months. Uh, key to it is the governance model. Uh, so essentially, Ministry of Agriculture acts as a steward uh, who are orchestrating the network. There's a network protocol through which various partners who want to supply or provide the content. So they we help, we are helping them curate the content uh, across the various departments, uh, across the various states. And this approved content, which is available on the network, can also, you know, the other departments who are into the extension can view it and use it to basically create uh you know, these intuitive interfaces through chatbot. What AI has been able to do is uh, the shift that has happened is uh, on two fronts. One is being able to ingest very unstructured uh, information that is lying across PDFs, across docs, audio files, video files, you know, tables and so on that can now be very well, very easily be ingested and we can make sense out of it uh, on one hand. And on the other hand, we have uh, the building blocks, which can help create these kind of uh, interfaces on Messenger or on app, or also on, you know, SMS or simple IVR kind of a thing. So this is, yeah, this is what the tech pipeline looks like. Uh, essentially, there is a knowledge base where uh, all the information approved content comes. It can be about practices or it could be a dynamic uh, information about, you know, soil and weather uh, input uh, uh, and market data. And then there is an entire AI ML stack, which uh, essentially includes a speech to text translation in the local language. There's a query orchestration or an agentic part, which I can, which I'll be showing uh, the demo uh, in, in a short file. And then uh, the key to it is pipeline, which is uh, log maintain. What it ensures is are, are grounded in the content itself, uh, which means that uh, it doesn't hallucinate. The LLMs have a, a kind of dream machines, uh, which can predict the next word, which comes out, you know, makes. So 
most of the times uh, but that was that the answer is generated from this approved content itself and then all of this conversations that are there are available on a on a on an interface uh, in a transparent manner where one can actually see uh, who is asking what and what are the answers and uh, human evaluators can then look at it subject matter ex experts can look at it from through different lenses and uh, provide improvement on the answers itself which can then further be used as a knowledge base uh, to improve the uh, improve the of the answers uh, and then there are interface uh, layer which is basically uh, you know uh, which is sort of different from the AI ML stack, which is the logic which is generating the answers to how do I want to present? So it could be a WhatsApp messenger or it could be a Telegram messenger or it could be a uh, IVR for that matter. Someone is asking on voice. Uh, so essentially these functions, they help uh, interact with these different kinds of APIs and uh, make sure that the uh, the answers or the uh, are presented in that particular interface itself. Uh, this is just the kind of uh, benchmarking and kind of quality assurance that we do where each of the input query that is there. So we have a candidate pipeline where I have a query and I have a response and they have a bunch of, it's not just one LLM call, but multiple calls to basically rephrase the question to re-rank or, or do a filtering of what we are retrieving and then what we are able to generate. And then we use multiple passes to get to the best possible answer and use it as a, uh, you know, in a reverse manner to uh, do an auto evaluation of the score. Uh, essentially, uh, it takes out what are the factual statements that are made out of the responses and whether these factual statements are grounded in the uh, in the paragraphs that has been retrieved in the first place so through this particular process we are able to calculate what is the what we call as faithfulness of the responses so far we have been able to get to a level of almost uh, you know zero or i'll not say exactly zero but very uh, less hallucination on the on the on the responses and then uh one of the things that we have been working on is also using the videos which we have created over a period of time uh not just our own videos but what it enables is ingest videos that have been that, that are created by different departments and uh through the and, and we can look at it through the lens of gender and climate as well where we are not just searching the videos based on the transcript so today the video recommendation system the way it works is uh what is the topic or the title and you know you have to tag it and so on and so forth now we are through the ai pipeline we can look inside the content so for the for example in this particular uh gif the question that is asked is, uh, how do I water the nursery beds? And it can go to that exact timestamps where I can use the description of what is happening inside the video to create a, you know, take it to the specific 10 second timestamp, probably create a GIF on the go and give it back to the, uh, to the user. Uh, one of the things that it enables is also help, uh, you know, promote a gender intentional or climate intentional kind of practices uh, where we can give case studies of uh, female farmers, uh, successful female farmers who have adopted certain things, certain practices that helps uh, create a social uh, you know, recognition. Uh, so, so far we are working with, uh, you know, we have rolled it out in the, in the field. There are various kinds of, uh, you know, uh, use cases that have emerged out. People are using on the field, uh, the extension workers are using, uh, one way is uh, they go on the field and there are certain questions and they want to know the answers. Uh, but they're also often using it before going to the field itself. 
before going to the farmers. They know the farmers and they want to just confirm their knowledge. So it has become a tool for them for uh, getting that bite-sized, very comp uh, you know readable information in a structured way, which was present in all these various docs, uh, which they don't which they lose access over a period of time. So they are able to prepare themselves for the conversation with the farmers. Uh, there are also sort of uh, uh, other use cases that have emerged out where they are able to uh, extract important videos or audios which can then be forwarded on different WhatsApp groups of the farmers themselves. Uh, what it offers to the partners, to the wider uh, agriculture ecosystem is anyone can link their content and they can also uh, link their services to consume that particular content uh, and you know build their own bot. Uh, with that, I will uh, uh, I'll just give a small demo of the recent uh, you know upgrade that we are working on, which is uh, which is using the uh, which is using the uh, you know the reasoning agent of the of the AI itself to create a much better experience. Uh, I guess I have to reshare my screen to I think uh, entire screen yep I hope you can see the screen so this is an example uh, you know uh, example conversation uh, for the for this particular talk I have just uh, gone ahead and have this conversation so in this particular example what we are doing is we are asking what is uh, tell me a video about wheat rust and uh, this is uh, essentially uh, one part of LLM is basically doing a particular task that you find on you know open AI like email composer or certain things. The second aspect that is more prevalent and has seen is kind of you know speaking with your own data which is basically the RAG retrieval augmented generation. The third is the LLMs display a lot of reasoning power. So essentially we can create an assistant uh, like you have a support center. When you call a support center, uh, it's a two-way conversation where I'm asking a query and the person has to understand, okay, this is what you need. They have an access to multiple tools. Uh, you know, uh, They will look into it. They'll prompt back as to you know further understand the problem and take you to a particular solution and essentially this is what uh, you know llm can do in the agriculture domain as well so here i'm i'm simply asking like uh, you know tell me a video so what it is doing is it it is calling a video search tool and it gives me a video which is fine about we trust the next is i ask it what is the seed treatment based on this particular video and the answer that it generates is this particular uh, chemical called beta wax. Now, where does this, where does it get this particular thing? Okay, I guess, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I guess, yeah, this, sorry, there are multiple videos open, uh, <laughs> windows open, so, uh, so. In this particular small video from ICR, uh, the person talks about that particular chemical, and if you if you read this, if you know Hindi, it says that you know the seed to be treated with this particular chemical called beta wax. So what it is doing is it is looking inside the video. Now I'm calling a different tool, which is like not searching the video, but what is inside the video, and it is able to read these characters and come up with the, the answer itself. And that's the answer that it generates uh, about that this particular chemical can be used, which was not spoken about in that particular video, but shown as a character. Uh, then I ask about the weather in my area. Now it is able to reason and understand that for calling the weather API, I need to know the location first uh, and it asks back to the user where do you stay 
I can write in a, you know, uh, in a free form that I live here and I do a mistake, uh, a grammatical mistake or uh, typographical maybe. <laughs> uh, it detects the, the district from here. And for that particular district, it is able to then call the weather API, give me a forecast. Next, I ask it, what are the pest and disease should I worry about? And for that, it basically refers to a, what we call as a crop weather calendar, which is a very complex kind of a uh, calendar, which uh, essentially gives what is that particular week of the year you know, in various districts and what are the kind of pest and disease attack that can happen and what are the weather conditions that are favorable for that. So it goes and looks into that particular kind of table and understands that it needs to use the weather information, which it has called earlier, and essentially finds out that the for the pest and disease to occur in that particular, in this particular time frame, uh, generally cloudy or high humidity, if it happens, unseasonal rainfalls, that will affect it. Since the weather is not there, uh, it's, it's sunny, so there is not much to worry about. But it leads back with an answer that you should be vigilant and monitor your crops. Uh, so essentially what this is able to do is uh, just like a, an assistant or a support staff, you know, staff, the LLM is able to reason through what a user wants and it has access to various tools, APIs, data sets, tables, and so on. And it can understand which API or tool to call and then prompt back the user that if it is missing something. So for instance, like if it is missing location, it can prompt back that I need your location. So it, it, it further, you know, enhances the conversational experience, which is very much required. A very simple question like what time do I sow uh, is a very difficult to uh, thing to answer. Uh, because it depends on multiple things on where you're located, what crop, what variety, uh, what are the weather forecast, and so on and so forth. What probably you have done earlier. And uh, so it has to be a conversational experience for the users. So it enhances that on the user side uh, on one hand. On the other hand, what it does is it allows ecosystem actors to create these kind of tools. So we have a rack pipeline, which is probably, which is on, you know, practices more on the techniques of it that, that could improve your yield and improve your agriculture productivity. Uh, but someone would be interested in, let's say, finding about the subsidies or whether I'm available, you know, whether I can apply for a certain subsidy. So someone can create those different rack pipelines or maybe a, fertilizer recommendation or a calculator uh, where I need to en enter the area and I can, you know, what the farmers or the extension workers finally need is that what is that specific amount that I want to apply. So these different tools can be created uh, and, and it enables on that particular side on the content providers to provide those, you know, build those their tools and publish it. Uh, and on this particular side, for the user to have this conversational experience through which they can reach a particular goal. So yeah, so this is where we are. I would be happy to take certain questions and uh, hope to, you know, try to answer that. Uh, thank you so much, Vinny. That was uh, very insightful. Uh, Samruddhi, you can uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, so, what are the most significant barriers to the adoption of uh, agricultural practices among farmers and uh, how does digital green work to overcome these hurdles? Yeah, I think uh, uh, this has been sort of the focal point of digital green. I think one of the main uh, things for the farmers on ground is uh, they need to trust 
what information is being uh, given. And typically they trust by seeing or they trust the person who is giving. And that's why the extension workers are, or also the, you know, in Kenya, for instance, the extension is sort of not that proper or organized. Aggressive farmers, we can call them, who have the access, to, and, and most of these extension workers, they have access to the, uh, or the lead farmers, they have access to the smartphones. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they can act as a, as an important buffer where they can act as a trust anchor for them. Uh, they can also use that particular information to actually try it out on their farm before actually, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, telling it to the farmers. So, uh, and, and this has been one of the sort of cornerstone, I would say, in the, in the video work. Uh, what video work did was instead of a top-down uh, you know, information flowing that use this particular seeds, you, you, you use this particular way of, uh, you know, technique of sowing or use this particular technique for controlling the uh, pest or disease and so on. What a particular farmer has done, you can record it. And then when you show that, that led to a very increased, uh, you know, adoption itself. Uh, so the trustworthy source of information, I would say, is the is the most important aspect. Uh, and that source of information is not only the digital information in a video or PDF or whatever we are talking about, but also the person matters. Uh, and this is where, you know, the AI part, uh, it's not just being able to access that information, but it gives a confidence to that intermediary to be able to explain it better, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and that leads to a more uh, fruitful conversations where the adoption is, is higher. Uh, the second question is like, uh, in the context of developing countries, uh, how does digital green ensure that the AI technologies developed are affordable, trustworthy, as well as user friendly for uh, small scale farmers? Yeah, so well, uh, as I said, well, the one of the key things is having a multimodal. So we are also working on, uh, you know, ingesting, uh, you know, the user can today type or they can record and Messenger gives that kind of, or, or the Android apps also give that kind of a rich user experience where they can write a question or they can type, uh, use, record using using a mic button. But a lot of times they need uh, to take, you know, image or they need to uh, take a video. So they're, I would just say that there are two very broad, uh, broad categories. One is they are trying to identify what is the problem on that I have, which is very often. Uh, there are new kinds of diseases. There are new kind of things on the on the ground on the uh, crops. The other is they have identified the. The problem and they want to know the solution or how to apply a solution where to find a solution what are the <laughs> uh you know financial things that uh that I, how do i find a subsidy to buy that particular uh you know thing what are the follow-up steps and so on so to identify a problem you need a multimodal kind of a uh approach and that is something that we are we are, we are further building in in the coming subsequent months uh in terms of affordability itself for the extension workers, for the farmers, this is uh, this is available, uh, you know, at <laughs> free of cost. So the whole idea of partnering with the government uh, and working in a not-for-profit way is to make it uh, completely open source as a digital public good. Uh, it is accessible for the people, uh, you know, for the agriculture community itself. Uh, the cost is definitely there, but the cost is basically borne by the by the ecosystem actors, I would say, in the long term. Uh, and and most important ecosystem actor would be, uh, you know, a lot of places would be government in in this particular case. Uh, how does digital green measure the impact of its AI interventions on farming communities and also what are the success metrics that are most indicative? Yeah, so I think uh, 
we the 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 basically uh two broad things that we do one is within the product itself so you, you must have seen for each of the answers it would have a thumbs up thumbs down button mm -hmm. and when i give that so so there are quick responses that we can get from the from the uh from the interface itself there's also uh you know when you give that thing there's also a form that can pop up which uh, they can uh, they can fill the form uh, rate the answers on a 1 to 5 rating and they can type what they liked or what what they disliked they can also take they can also give the feedback in a voice or an image kind of a thing so this is kind of giving uh, uh, on each of the answers each of the responses uh, how what they uh, you know how what they liked or disliked about that the second is uh, you know is about the monetary uh, you know the mel part which is the evaluation and the uh, you know monitoring evaluation and learning where we do randomized control trials on different groups of farmers to see how they are uh, how well they are able to you know adopt a service which is a more intensive process where you do a survey a, a proper statistical survey uh, the idea is that it would help farmers to become better at you know farming itself uh, so it's kind of you know a lot of this thing uh, there's an analogy between you know what we do in and the educational sector as well so when you are able to provide a better content a better interface you help a person become better at what they are doing so in the education sector the kids would become better at a certain skill or someone will become better but eventually the impact of it would happen over a period of time over certain seasons when uh, they would have adopted and continued and they would see an increased yield uh, and probably after that increased income uh, so so yeah so the the most important aspect is the adoption of that particular practice so that how they are uh, uh, you know how how improve improved they are in a in a particular season okay uh, also uh, given the challenges associated with the data scarcity in this sector uh, how do you approach the training of ai models to ensure it's efficient and reliable yeah so uh, there are bunch of things that that we are doing uh, one is we are using uh, working with the government to get organize all these approved content now most of these content is available on on various websites but it is uh, a lot of these content is uh, outdated or something like that so you have to work and curate that uh use it to create a bot so basically we create a forward <laughs> pipeline but then for each of the question and answers that we get we are now giving it back to set of experts from agronomic point of view from extension point of view from climate point of view from gender point of view who would uh, look at the responses and suggest certain improvement and most of the time there are certain domain specific terms domain specific information uh, that can be added which becomes the new knowledge source that is fed back uh, to the to the pipeline itself uh, and that the, the, this is what we call as a golden question answer set that we are you know in the in this particular process uh, helping create uh, which would improve the quality of the answers it would improve on, on from different angles okay uh, also how do you balance the need for ai to make uh, data driven decisions uh, with the importance of human expertise and intuition in agriculture yeah uh, and this is where the the uh, the assistant part comes into picture uh, i think uh, we have to we, we are looking at ai as a tool that can enhance uh, you know the the local or the contextual knowledge itself now there are a lot of things that are very very contextual in nature uh, you know you you go in a particular geography uh, 
the sort of wisdom that is passed on for generation yeah. uh, and certain things that are also wrong right uh, but the decision to you know do a certain thing is not an easy decision it's like you know kind of uh, what is the what is it that i should uh, eat to be healthy it's it's not an easy <laughs> easy question yeah uh, you know every now and then you will have that you know something is good and then later on that it is also bad so someone will say intermittent fasting and then you will see that no it is not good probably after a certain time so so there is published kind of research uh, that is there but then there is also the local information that is so so that published information that is researched that is well researched that has been vetted by agronomic experts uh provides as a as an input uh where it can suggest that this is what you should do but then the final decision is mostly dependent on the people themselves so ai will augment uh the way you are able to you know access those those well researched well published kind of uh you know tools that are available and that is what you know the last part where i said uh, where, where, where i shown that llms are also able to one of the things that you know surprising thing that they are able to exhibit is able to reason understand and what they are able to uh, do it in a very unstructured way like you know normal the way we talk and using that they can decide what tools or what are the kind of data sets they should look at and provide certain prompts back to the user uh, but then it is a way of augmenting and not a way of replacement in a way thank you anit that was very insightful uh, we'll jump into the uh, questions from the audience yeah kishore has raised hand yeah uh, hi uh, good evening am i audible yeah 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 sorry i am uh, on the way traveling somewhere uh, thanks for the session uh, it was very insightful so basically this is kishore i am uh, we are working on uh, um, uh, I, I'm a part of uh, a non-profit from Tamil Nadu in Madurai, uh, Palseva. So basically, we are uh, creating some animal husbandry uh, related stuff as a part of ISDM fellowship. Um, we're creating a chatbot with traditional methods uh, that is that was sourced up for the past 30 years through the NGO network, Honeybee network from Ahmedabad. And... Uh, uh, we run a, we started with the chatbot now uh, we wanted to go multi model um, that's the goal so uh, my question is uh, how do we collaborate with uh, this initiative of digital green and uh, be it uh, organizationally or legally technically technologically in all uh, ways yeah <laughs> uh, so this uh the Swiss star should be officially be launched somewhere after June. Uh, and I guess uh, the government or the ministry would be also be keen to, uh, you know, we are, the idea is to look at it not as a siloed thing, but as an ecosystem enabler thing where, uh, let's say, players like you who want to, who are working on field with the farmers on a particular topic can join that particular network, get access to those content. You can get access to those technical building blocks as well. And, you know, then create your own bot. Uh, that would, uh, that can reach out to those, those farmers. Uh, we can, you know, we, we, we can connect uh, separately as well. And, uh, I can introduce you to certain people uh, and see if there are already uh, certain content that would be helpful for you. And there are certain, you know, tech blocks that can be used. Uh, but yeah, uh, more formally, it would be, it would be, you know, tentatively 
be available around June, July, something of that time frame. Uh, right now we are doing all these pilots in, uh, you know, knowingly in north of India and in Hindi specific, uh, you know, build because the language barrier, uh, in the AI because these are like, uh, you know, low resource NLP, uh, even in Hindi itself is, uh. You know, if you just look at the Wikipedia pages in English and Wikipedia pages in Hindi, it's like 0.01%. Uh, as soon as you go to regional languages, it becomes a bit uh, difficult. So we are first targeting Hindi, which has more presence on the web so that there are better models. But then there are also, you know, partnership with, uh, there, there are also people who are involved from Bhashini and uh, other government collaborators through which it would be available in most of the major languages, including uh, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Marathi, Odia, Bengali, uh, even Assam. Uh, so, uh, but that would be, I would say, phase two. One of the things that we have to be very careful is not giving any wrong information to the farmers or the extension workers. Uh, and language can, you know, Play a major role in uh, sort of creating a different inference of the same stuff that or the, what we want to convey versus what it actually means. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you know we can do. It. There are certain initiatives that are already taking place in this particular part in this particular project in Tamil Nadu itself. So I can probably you know we can informally uh, you know start collaborating on that yeah definitely that would be great uh yeah so do you also work with state governments because uh, agriculture being a concurrent uh, uh, subject so uh, states will have an upper hand so i'm not sure how center is coordinating on this with states but uh, yeah i would like to know how what is the role of states like how you have you collaborated with them yeah uh uh so the center is acting more as a as a network orchestrator itself. Now, various states would be participants and there would be various departments who would be sub-participants. So, so generally, uh, you know, in the agriculture, there are multiple departments. Uh, it's not just the Ministry of Agriculture or Department of Agriculture. There's live, uh, you know, animal stock, uh, animal livestock and animal husbandry separate, horticulture is separate. Uh, water irrigation department is separate there i think a, a dozen departments that are that are there and they all have their own extension as well uh but right now uh the center's role is more to play as a network orchestrator where they can get the central agriculture research organization under icr uh and then the kvks and the central extension workers in atma and so on to be part participant plus the state and the state would also have it, it's not just ministry uh you know agriculture but there would, would be rural livelihood and development they would become participants and their own departments can come and publish content uh one of the things you know there could be more features like how much weightage you want to give uh you know a certain state may have a better contextual information uh uh about the particular topic so for specific topics of specific crops what is the weightage that can be given uh you know that can be uh, that can be played around with so those are kind of uh governance level kind of things that are also being worked on uh but the idea is to be all inclusive and be a you know make it available for all the states yeah, definitely. Thanks for that. So basically, uh, we have just started a couple of months back, I mean, focusing on animal husbandry. Um, just to say, I mean, because the we, our budget is limited, and we, this is also part of fellowship where uh, we, it's a fellowship for creating digital public goods as well. So this is why I think we align more, and uh, uh, you have a uh, long road ahead of us. Uh, I mean, you started way back. Uh, yeah. So and also. We uh, are hosting our own uh, infrastructure and those things, uh, but there are constraints for us. 
and uh, it would be definitely helpful if we get uh, pointers from your side. Uh, thank yeah. you for the uh, yeah. Definitely, we can I'll, connect, and uh, I would be happy to connect you to our team uh, in Delhi who is collaborating. Uh, yeah. and uh, you know, we can take it forward. Yeah, definitely, I will connect with you in family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thanks, thanks to Hasbi uh, for this session. Uh, so we have a uh, couple of questions from Bharat. Uh, first is, uh, how many languages is the bot supporting in India? Yeah, so far we are, uh, we have launched it in Hindi speaking and uh, Odisha we have, we have just launched. Uh, we are, we are testing it because Odia is a very low resource language. Uh, it's also available in the dialect like Bhojpuri, which is spoken in, you know, Gangetic region of UP, Bihar, Jharkhand. So, those the dialects are also available uh for basically translation and you know speech recognition part we are using off the shelf apis there's this right now uh what we are seeing is that it works pretty well for general stuff uh but there are certain limitations uh one is for the very domain specific terms it doesn't have you know it, it makes errors uh my favorite example is one of the places uh, the person says uh, it's Dimak Nashak, which is which basically means termite killer. And the translation is, uh, you know, <laughs> demagnetic powder. So, <laughs> which is totally off. So, so those kind of domain specific, uh, you know, terms uh, are something that we are looking at. So, we are looking to provide it to the researchers in the language domains. Uh, who would, you know, augment these uh, translation and speech uh, models better uh, for the local languages. Uh, the second is, the limitation is that many of the times the translation, even if correct, the, the level of, uh, you know, when we are translating it in Hindi, it's a very proper Hindi uh, rather than the way it is spoken, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, in English we get, so we are able to prompt and say that, give it in a simple readable format in a structured way. So what people are liking is that structured, simple way that they can comprehend, uh, uh you know, that has been the make, biggest value proposition that, uh, these documents and these things are, uh, basically driven by researchers and a lot of time they are scholarly in nature, uh, you know. Uh, it's difficult to understand, uh, but AI is able to create those answers, which are very, very readable, but it stops at English. Uh, so how to make it very well, uh, in the local language, in a, in a way that, you know, it's not the purest form, uh, but something that is spoken, uh, that's, that's a, something that, that will take some time. Uh, but yeah. In terms of like, if if we have to launch it, I would say most of the, I, I would say 10 to 12 major languages that are in India, uh, you know, that you see in web translation, uh, you know, on Google and all these places should be possible to start with, with certain errors, uh, obviously on the domain specific terms. And it may not be the best representation of how people are speaking. Uh, that would be the constraint. But uh, what we are seeing is with the increased usage, we are able to get and correct it and feed it back, uh, you know, and improve uh, the, those particular uh, language barriers. Uh, the second question is, uh, is this a funded project? I guess you already mentioned that you're working with the government, but if you would like to add anything specific. Yeah, uh, so uh, Digital Green uh, is a, Global not for profit organization. We are funded. We are backed by various uh, donors and uh, you know, uh, like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Walmart Foundation, USAID, UKFCDO, a lot of uh, other grants that that we get. So we uh we fund our work through those grants, uh, helping build these technology and these 
uh, you know products uh, but partner with the government to for them to basically institutionalize it and take it to the uh, you know at, at the population scale Uh, are any OSS AI uh, LLM models uh, used in the backend for various AI tasks? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, so, so we are at, uh, so far we we have our approach has been to use the best in class kind of models, uh, but uh, to create the best possible answers, uh, and also to create those evaluation and uh, you know, open AI or anthropic and and so on comes on top. But we are also seeing, uh, we are also, you know, uh, basically trying out with the open source models like Mistral, Llama, and, uh, you know, others. And uh, looking at how well they perform. And then they're, you know, as I showed in that particular pipeline, it's not just one LLM call, there are multiple LLM calls uh, at various places where we can start replacing uh, with the open source uh, uh, you know, uh, LLMs. Uh, another follow-up question, uh, are the models being fine-tuned? Yeah, so this has been a constant kind of a debate in the in the AI, uh, I would say, sector itself, RAG versus uh, fine-tuned. So, in fact, uh, uh, we had worked with OpenAI, uh, you know, and, and there was an OpenAI uh, blog post uh, which was on November 8th dev day they have uh, just before that they have released where they showed that fine tune versus rag so if you want a very domain specific uh, you know fine tuning helps if you are if I want to model uh, let's say I have an ideal extension worker persona and I have an ideal kind of an answer and I want to basically emulate that tone of telling things or writing things then fine-tuning would make sense uh, but if you want to get the accurate answers that should be that that is where the rag works and there have been various papers which have pu been published which say that rag plus any base model is almost as good as you know, fine-tuned plus RAG or fine-tuned model itself. Uh, there has been a recent study done with by Microsoft uh, with whom we have also collaborated uh, where they published a detailed uh, analysis on USDA uh, extension and, and their question answers and so on. And there was hardly any difference between fine-tuned plus RAG or base model plus RAG. So, uh, so yeah, so if maybe in future the fine tuning would work when we have those golden QA more and more. And typically the threshold is like, you need, need more than 100,000 of such, uh, you know, golden question answers to have significant data so that you can actually fine tune. Uh, before that, the, the, the cost of fine tuning is way too high versus the positives that you get. So that the trade-off doesn't make sense. Before you have a very high number of, uh, like like we have hundred thousand plus conversations, but a lot of lot of those conversations would have a repeat kind of questions. So unless you have a very vast set of unique kind of topics and questions, uh, and their perfect ideal answers, uh, it it doesn't make uh that much sense in going for the fine tuning. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was very insightful. Um. Uh. So with this, I think uh, we are at the end of the session. Also, right on time. Um. So uh, the project itself. Uh, we are going to continue beyond. Um. Our. Uh, you know. Um. Uh, so these sessions have been. Uh. Uh. We have been. Uh way to get uh, to a report, to generate a report uh, based on insights gathered and guidelines and best practices. 
um so even after the report we'll be continuing on uh, peer review sessions where people can uh, talk about projects that they're working on ai the problems that they're facing and the community the broader community can join in to give them feedback and help out um so i will drop the link for the call for proposals for that um apart from that we will be generating a report uh, based on all the sessions that we're having for specific guidelines and risks on each of these domains, which are agri-tech, fintech, health tech, and uh, public services, as well as education. Um, so that's a bit about the project and the Until Inside community itself that, that's uh, focused on AI use cases and uh, risks, ethics, um, so issues around that. Um, with that, I think uh, we're at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Vinny, for joining us. It was a great session. Uh, and thank you so much, Samrithi, for moderating it. It was uh, fantastic to have both of you here. Uh, thank you, Bharat and Kishore, for your questions. It was a very engaging conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.